and the, the, uh, the wonderful things that public service tele can do. I, I come from Canada, where we do have a public service broadcaster, but it's a lot more like C4, where it's commercial, uh, but it gets its spectrum for free and a limited amount of public funding. But the idea of a truly public broadcaster with no commercial remit, really there just to inform, entertain, and uh, educate, um, is really um, uh, stellar. At the same time, it seems like the BBC has developed a somewhat um, schizophrenic relationship with its own remit, where it, there, there are days when it feels like they've already decided they're not going to get the license fee, and so they need to figure out how to turn worldwide from 5% to 100% of their uh, income by 2016. And uh, if that means putting DRM on everything and, and abandoning the um, public service remit, well, so be it. And certainly the regulator seems to be there, too. Uh, I was part of the group that went to Ofcom during the, uh, the uh, proposal to allow the BBC to put DRM on its high-definition broadcasts. And what Ofcom essentially told us was, um, well, if they are going to act not in the public interest and we regulate them to force them to do it, well, then all the good programs will go to the other broadcasters uh, who we don't regulate as, as directly as we regulate the BBC. So if someone's going to violate the public interest, at least they should be violated under the, under the oversight of people like us, rather than no oversight at all, even though our oversight requires us not to do anything. Um, incidentally, they also said that they thought forum would have been good if it had gone forward on that same basis, because if, if everyone's privacy is going to be invaded, it should at least be invaded under the oversight of Ofcom, instead of invaded without Ofcom knowing what's going on. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say, and I'll let my uh, co uh, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves and start with you. Uh, hello, my name is David Thompson. I'm not quite sure what to say about myself. Um, I have some quite radical views, and I'm trying to take the BBC to task over what I'm trying to do with the Arab. So, um, did, did you want to expand on that a little? Uh, yes, uh, because of lack of any um, awareness of anybody else doing it, uh, the only thing that seemed effective was just by how the BBC is breaking. Breaking the law, which is against BBC policy, so I don't need to go for a judicial review. I can put it to the BBC, and if they accept what I say, what I say they will then hopefully change their policy. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tony Curtin Price from Open Democracy, and um, I've become interested in the role of the BBC in various ways. One is that um, at, at Open Democracy, we believe that we provide public service content, and so we're interested in those who manage to pay themselves decent salaries while claiming to do so. Um, this led us to do something called, to, to start something called the Public Sector Broadcasting Forum, um, which essentially was shadowing the BBC's strategy review, and actually about two, um, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, in this building, I sort of innocently walked into a a, a, a conference around that broadcasting forum and told a group of BBC watchers that I didn't have a license here and I didn't have a television and I thought the BBC had a problem going forward and that it wasn't, it wasn't going to recreate its audience in the way in which it did as a retail organisation in the 50s and 60s. And I thought this was, you know, kind of slightly uncontentious statement, but I got booed. Uh, and, got, and not only did I get booed by this audience, people came up to me afterwards and said, you're such a poor case. You know, you're missing something really, really important here. Um, you, don't, you, you don't follow BBC television. And so that um, got me to, understand, to ask more questions and understand, uh, try and understand more about BBC. Frank Field on that day gave a very, very interesting talk. Um, I recommend you go and have a look at it on the website, it's, it's, it's recorded, um, in which he, I think, correctly identified the BBC as being the inheritor, and in many ways the extremely uh, good inheritor of the Church of England. And, and I think that actually socially, uh, sociologically gets it exactly right. The BBC is a producer of public ideology, and I'm you know, all for the production of public, public ideology, uh, and for the public provision of public ideology, but just as happens to churches, they become self-serving organisations. And I think it's very important in understanding the BBC as an organisation to always think about, is it being true to its principles, 
which are excellent principles. They're principles about being the um, uh, the voice of Britishness in some sense, or is it being true to its organisational interests, which are usually focused around maintaining its pull tax, the licence, and the two are sometimes aligned and sometimes not aligned. Um, on this question of DRM, which I think is particularly interesting to this audience, it seems to me that um, the licence fee may be our friend in an anti-DRM sense, because once you put DRM onto content, all of a sudden it's possible for the BBC to have an indistinguishable business model from Sky or other pay-per-view television. So a consequence of putting DRM onto content is that the license fee, the logic of the license fee, is undermined. And that, it seems to me, is a very, very powerful institutional lever to get the BBC onto the side of the anti-DRM. Now, I'd be very interested to know from those of you who know why, given that analysis of it, uh, they're so keen on DRM for HDTV. My name's uh, Norma Roberts. Um, some of you will know my name, um, for the benefit of probably the majority who don't. Um, I'm a troublemaker, uh, predominantly. One of the things I've done is try to take the BBC to task over its stance on both um, iPlayer and Freeview HD DRM. And I think it's important to, to put this into a little bit of context. The BBC itself, I think, is a fantastic institution. It's, I think institution is entirely the, the right word for it. In the same way that we value the NHS, for example, despite its many flaws, um, much the same applies to the BBC. It's a behemoth. It's a massive organisation filled with hundreds of conflicting viewpoints on any given issue. And it's publicly funded. And somehow, out of all of this, it manages to muddle through and produce content which is world-renowned. Um, you know, the, the BBC is something that Britain's envied for internationally. And I think it's very easy to, to lose sight of that fact uh, from within the UK. You know, you, it, it's something we take for granted, is the, the quality of the output of the BBC. And sometimes it produces things which are bad, and sometimes it produces things that are good. And what I consider to be good and bad is probably different to what you might consider to be good and bad. Um, but that's what the BBC is, and it's fantastic for it. But it seems to have sleepwalked into this realm whereby it comes under pressure to behave more like a commercial entity. Um, part of this is because its remit is no longer solely to be the public service broadcaster, but also to provide the infrastructure so that others who are not burdened with as it were, with the same remit, can also get their content into people's homes. And so you have the situations, as with Freeview HD, where although it's well and good making the argument about what the BBC should and shouldn't do on their own, the counter-argument that, that's used is that it's not just the BBC who is arguing for it. They are the ones responsible for delivering this solution, if you can call it that. But it's the other broadcasters, people like Channel 4, who ironically are of the other broadcasters the most regulatory burdens themselves, um, who are calling for this just a lot more quietly and behind the scenes. And so... There are a lot of people who don't really see anything wrong in, in what the BBC has been doing. They don't see a problem with the BBC, the broadcast chain, instead of ending at the transmitter 
and that being the extent of the BBC's remit, it actually going as far as the individual pieces of equipment in your home. And that's a, a, a huge change in what the BBC has had responsibility for. And it's a change which has come about almost by accident over the past few years. And it's one which its importance is, is vastly understated. And I think most of those who have been responsible for bringing out, bringing out that change um, don't necessarily realise the consequences of, of what they've brought about. Um, so my role really has been a voice, really just saying, well, hold on a minute, um, this isn't really right. This is going to have huge unintended consequences. And as Tony pointed out, uh, it means that they're no longer operating true to the license fee and their own principles and their own values which are to get the content to everybody in an agnostic fashion. And as soon as you start giving them control of what things you can and can't have in the living room, which things are supported or not supported, which is a, a phrase which has come about recently, um, then you've ch completely changed the dynamic about what the BBC is, is about. And it's it's important to bear in mind through all of this that this is one small part of a very, very big, very capable organisation and, um, and it's something that can be changed and something that can be fixed. Great. So the way I'd like to structure this, I'm going to move this mic, whoop, move this mic over here and I'm going to play talk show host so that I can take the mic out to people who have questions. Um, who had, first, before we start, is there anyone who wants to mention that they work for the BBC? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, who has a question? Uh, Alright, we'll start back here. Um, I just had a question about what exactly the BBC's current stance is on um, copyright, particularly against generated content, because I know in 2000 there's been some debate about that. And I don't know that that's something any of the panels could answer because they could build. No? Does anyone from the BBC care to answer that? From the BBC's point of view, they have the right to copyright. My name is Bill Thompson, and at the moment I'm working with the BBC Archive Development Team, so I am inside the machine. Quite a lot of time, but I don't speak for the BBC. I don't know if it's fair to Um I think um, the point was made that, that there are lots of different points of view in the BBC, and lots of different people trying to do different things. And as a result, there are inconsistencies and indeed contradictions between the various areas and what people try to do. All of it within the, the, the broad remit of delivering the BBC's public purposes and doing it properly, but trying to cope with the fact that those people who grew up and developed their careers in the broadcast world are fundamentally confused by, frightened of, and not necessarily comfortable with what's happening in the world. And so a lot of the issues that we see are because of this essential clash of cultures, and that's within the BBC as well as in the wide world. So when it comes to UGC, there's a general attempt to play nice that isn't quite carried through. So there is quite a right square because the BBC traditionally is used to getting contributors like myself in the radio to sign in all rights and all forms of you know, media in this whole universe, whether invented, not invented, or you know, dreamed up in the mind of the great emperor Zahn on wet Thursday in New York. That's the way it's always operated. You try to change that as a long term process. So, so at the moment, things may not be ideal. I'm actually, again, I'm inside, so discount this, but I'm more optimistic about the general desire to do the work. If, if I've got so anything to do with it, it's not going to happen. I'm going to do my utmost to stop it. I'm in the BBC. I don't know where it thinks it gets a mandate to impose DRM on people, on the public. The public are not demanding DRM. Free to air television, it's against the ethos of free to air television. It is breaking our, our human rights, and that is the argument I'm trying to put forward to the BBC to force them not to go down this route. I just do not understand why the BBC have done this at all. It really does 
baffle me as to why they've gone down this route. Uh, as for the pressure from the um, from the rights holders, well, I put a complaint into the OFT, the Office of Fair Trade, that they are acting as a cartel under the Enterprise Act. Unfortunately, I have got a response from the OFT who has referred me to Ofcom saying they don't regulate Ofcom, which wasn't actually the point I was making. I was making the point that the rights holders are acting as a cartel to put pressure on the UK as a whole to actually try and achieve DRM. So I will be getting back to the LFT uh, to try and force them to do something on this. Tony so, no. so, so my, as I, as I think I hinted at, I think my, my view is that uh, a DRM BBC output eventually and inevitably leads to the end of the licence fee. And the end of the licence fee is, means that public service content is, the, the, the way it's provided is up for grabs all of a sudden. So, you know, uh, actually, I think I welcome uh, some institutional change in this. I'm very much for public service provision. I'm very much for pluralism in that provision. So, unfortunately, I'm in the position of thinking that rather tactically, that DRM is going to undermine uh, is going to undermine the license fee, which I think is a good thing. It's so bad it's good. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I agree with Tony to an extent. Um, the BBC tends to walk a very 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 fine line, and and by that I mean razor thin. Um, the agreements by which it works with third parties, uh, of which there are many, um, are long and arduous and contain vast numbers of conditions. And for a given programme, there will be a vast number of these agreements. And so, when it comes under pressure, there is a tendency, I think almost through necessity, that the BBC will not take a particular view although there will be individuals within it who do, but instead seek to find a solution which satisfies the conditions. And as a result, it will be satisfying the letter rather than the spirit of those conditions. And so we have a situation where free-to-air actually doesn't mean unencrypted or unencumbered, it just means you don't need to pay anything to receive it, because that's what it actually says. And so, what the BBC attempts to do is rather than say, well, is this a good thing, is this a bad thing, is this something we should fight for necessarily, instead says, well, how can we reach a happy medium that satisfies all of the parties and doesn't do something that's illegal? Well, I do think what they're doing is illegal. I think encrypting the system information is illegal under European law. There's the television without frontiers, which means you've got to be able to rebroadcast television that appears, that, that crosses frontiers within the EU. And I don't see how Ofcom has squared that circle. They, I'm waiting for a reply from the BBC on that issue, but I don't I think, know. I how think Ofcom the answer there is that nobody knows. That, that's the problem there, is where it has been considered. Um, in a lot of cases, it, it's considered to be one of those completely grey areas. It's never been tested. Nobody has a clue. And so, they're kind of just rolling with it. So, in my view, it feels like the BBC keeps claiming that it was held hostage. Sorry, I moved up to the front for this part. In my view, it feels like the BBC keeps claiming they were held hostage to this, that they were required to do this, but they won't say by whom, right? They won't say, they say, rights holders have told us that we'll withhold content unless we have DRM. And we say, which rights holders is what we can't tell you. Um, and lots of people sort of send me emails saying, you know, I work for the BBC and I think the major rights holder is worldwide. I think it's our own division, it's our commercial division. Mm -hmm. But we can't say that on the record. And so when we asked Ofcom, they haven't produced any rights holders who claim that they'll boycott. What are you going to do about this? Because, you know, the last time this happened was in the United States where they said without DRM, we won't broadcast, uh, we won't allow our material to be broadcast. And all these rights holders made these claims. None of them came through with it. If we, the public, don't know which, which programs we're supposed to be losing, how do we know whether or not we're getting a good deal? Uh, and and I, I do think that the absence of a visible rights holder is very scary. Ofcom said, oh, well, the BBC told us secretly which rights holders will not allow content and which content it will be. 
but we can't tell you what it is because that's that's business secrets. Uh, more questions. I saw your hand go up, but there are other people in the back here, so let's go back here. Just wondering, what do you think of the decision by the BBC to make iPlayer on the smartphone iPhone exclusive? And do you also think, as I do, that this goes against the BBC's neutrality remit? I don't want to jump in every time. Um, well, actually, that's the only question. Eh? Uh, <laughs> you won't stop me. You definitely wow. stopped me before. Um, yes, on the iPhone, well, uh, it's unencumbered by the IRM, so everybody's trying to access the content that's on the iPhone. Yes, they should make it available to... They should be, the BBC seem to have a strange attitude towards their content in that they are paid for by public funds, they are dealt paid for by the rights holders, and they should be making their product available to the public in whatever way the public wishes to consume it. Any questions? Is there a way of letting the BBC, or making the BBC, provide non-DRM content at the same time letting the uh, commercial places come up with their own solutions? I think in terms of um, in terms of Freeview, Freeview HD, um, it's difficult. Um, what the solution, uh, for those who don't know, is um, it's a bit sneaky and it's a bit clever and it's one whereby the content itself isn't encrypted. Okay? The EPG data is scrambled with a fairly simple algorithm. It's a, it's a well-known algorithm, but you need a decoding table in order to unscramble it. Now, the decoding table can be reverse engineered. Uh, MythTV reverse engineered it when it was rolled out on FreeSat uh, last year. And so, it's something that can be worked around if, as an individual, you want to. But as a commercial entity, rather than this be some kind of actual protection mechanism, because it's clearly not, the whole purpose is that nobody will, in their right mind, sell a Freeview HD box which doesn't support the EPG. And nobody will take the risk of legal action by selling a box which uses a reverse engineered decoding tape. And so, what this means is that although the, the pirates can um, get at the content exactly as before, completely unhindered by this mechanism, um, all the restrictions, all the actual implementation of the rights management is all something that happens in the hardware. And so the only way by which the BBC can provide this mechanism for the other broadcasters but not actually play a part in it themselves is by them not being involved in the multiplex that implements it. And that is a huge problem to solve. It is, I don't think it's a feasible one. Couldn't they just pledge not to ever switch it on for any of their content? Well the problem is is that the the information is is going to, is carried on the multiplex. Right? So it, it it's common to the transmission stream, so right, it will okay. apply to all of the channels simultaneously. Um, first observation, um, I recall that the production company who produced the Spooks TV series came out very strongly in favour of BBC DRM, but didn't go so far as to say they would withdraw, withhold their productions if BBC DRM wasn't um, included. Second question, are we just looking at the, the DVD CSX region coding debate all, all over again? I mean, I still can't watch DVDs legally on my computer. Any comment from the panelists? Uh, I, th I think on, uh, on the Kudos front, who uh, the, the people who produce Spooks, um, yeah, they, they've been quite vocal about uh, the terrible threat that the internet poses to their business. Um, but it, it has primarily been PR um, and little beyond that. They're, most of it, I think, is down to secondary markets, which this has very little to do with. The, the thing about the, the Freeview HD DRM is, is that it's not anything about preventing people 
who rip TV shows from the broadcast stream and put them on the internet. It doesn't do anything to prevent that, um, not in any meaningful way at least, and they know it. Everybody involved in the whole chain knows that it does nothing to pre prevent that. Or the whole thing is focused on, much as with DVD region coping, controlling what the individual consumer can and can't do, which is quite a different thing from what's being talked about. It's been framed as an anti-piracy measure, when in reality it's controlling the use of content by the individual consumer. Well, yeah, I suppose basically, is DRM just a little box to be cracked open by the next hacker to turn his or her mind to it? I mean, what what is it cheap? And I know you were actually raising that point just there. It, it just is a means of leveraging control. We're just raising the technical barrier um, for an individual to consume content. Uh, shouldn't it just be public knowledge that that's the case? That's why it's being done. Otherwise, it's just really frustrating that being told it's an anti-piracy measure. The same way that you know ID cards are supposed to stop terrorism, and terrorists obviously have resources sufficient to you know forge passports, and a normal individual doesn't. Is this not just the same thing being tried in a different uh, context? And if I can try and explain it in a simple way, what it is is the electronic program drive will effectively be encrypted, and it will go onto a set-top box, and then the set-top box will use another DRM scheme called Marlin. So effectively, this is the same DRM that's used on the PS3. So what you will have is, once it's on the set-top box, it gets uh, controlled by the DRM on the set-top box called Marlin, which is and say the same news by the uh, PS3. The Myth TV uh, reverse engineered the Huffman tables for FreeSat, so if you've got FreeSat, you can get the EPG and then you can use the facilities in the EPG to record things. So, yes, the people, it's people without much technical knowledge or without the desire to run something like Myth TV to try and extract the programs that will be the inconvenience. It's because your set top box will actually DRM it, so it won't put it to anything that has not HDMI. I think box. I think it actually goes it goes far beyond just people who want to run Myth TV um, and the like, because it, it it controls quite specifically what people buying the branded Freeview HD boxes can do with the content that they've got, and that's that's the most important aspect of it, and that's that. Although the as a consequence, it impacts what you can and can't use to receive the content. The fact is, the boxes that people will go out and buy in the main from Curry's you know, uh, are going to be ones which implement the DRM scheme. And it doesn't actually matter that there are other solutions that people can use in order to get the content, because that's not what people will go out and buy. You know, it's great that I could use, um, I could use tools to record the stream directly to a PC's hard disk. Um, that's fantastic. You know, I could do that today, I could do that when the scheme is switched on, with maybe only a few days intervening. Um, but, you know, my grandmother on the other hand, she's the one who has to play ball with the, the DRM scheme. She's the one who needs to make sure that her high definition TV supports HDMI, HDCP, and isn't a slightly older one which uses component input because that won't work. The, the ordinary consumer is the one who is inevitably inconvenienced, and pretty much nobody else. Well, there was one other really important group who really got done by this, which is blind and deaf people. Because in addition to the EPG being encrypted, they're also scrambling with assistive information and uh, closed captioning in the secondary audio track that describe the action for, for blind people. Um, those two underserved markets increasingly are better served by free software markets, than, by free software tools, uh, than by commercial operators who frankly don't see them as big enough market. Hi, uh, I'm Tim Dobson. Um, during the iPlayer, um, the launch of iPlayer, I campaigned quite hard um, about the DRM that was at the time so very much at the heart of it all. Um, I just, I mean, at that time I was kind of protesting on streets outside BBC Manchester and obviously sending emails like the rest of us. 
I wondered what the panel thought was the most effective way of actually campaigning and bringing these issues kind of into the public, public knowledge, because um, there's clearly quite a lot of people inside the BBC who have strong feelings um, against these DRM technologies um, and people outside. So I, I just wondered what people thought was the most effective way of engaging everybody um, in, the, in, the, in the situation. Okay, uh, um, my, my, my sense is that it is linking the consequences of DRM to license fee. As soon as technologically you're indistinguishable from Sky, there comes a point which you have to say, why from a business point of view should the BBC be supplying material which is relatively similar to Sky's, but under a, under a compulsory tax? And I think that in a sense that, that comes from the fundamental, the sort of fundamental tension, what I think is the fundamental tension at the heart of the BBC. So on the one hand, the, the, again, there was a very interesting, very telling interview in the Public Sector Broadcasting Forum session by Tessa Jowell, said that she, in the Cabinet, found almost no friends of the BBC. The Cabinet kept saying to her, you know, make sure, you know, that we don't like the BBC, make sure that are the people voting for us do. That pushes the BBC towards being more and more like its commercial rivals. In other words, you know, delivering the stuff that people would be willing to pay for. On the other hand, its legitimation is that it's different from that. So the argument, in, the, the argument that it has to make to justify its tax is different from the political argument it has to make in order to win its place. And, and that, it seems to me, is the sort of the weak point. So if you, if you make sure that you connect the fact that DRM will eventually put it in the same category as Sky, they have to run away from DRM. Um, so we're almost out of time. Who's got a question still? Felix? Who else? Two. And you've already had a question, so I'm not going to call on you. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to get you two, and then we'll have closing remarks from the panelists. So uh, quick questions. Uh, so I just wanted to come back to the, the stuff about who gets inconvenienced by DRM. And I think there's a third group that we should touch on here, which is obviously the end users and people without a kind of high level of technological knowledge and uh, people who require assistive access to, to the media. We also think there's an element where businesses are getting penalised by this in that they're, they're being forced to provide a kind of piece of hardware that is crippled in some way or they can't add certain functionality and they can't move forward. They're kind of very much snapshot, this is where we were when we set the legislation on the RM, and you can't do new technology around this. Um, and I think the, you know, kind of the question that I want to put to the panel is really, to what extent do you think the BBC does have a, a sort of, I know it's not an official part of its mandate to a large extent, but has a real duty to provide a playing field that supports innovation in media, kind of online and on TV. Hold your answers, and I'm going to get the last question, and then we'll have closing remarks. So it's a very simple question. Um, setting aside the political and moral implications, what's the practical impact of uh, DRM here, apart from affecting copying or time shifting? All right, closing remarks. Starting with David. Uh, well, so practically, that's that you can do parody, you can even print screen a single scene from a HD content to comment on. These are the exceptions in the copyright law. There are, there are rights, unlike what Ofcom says. They are not a defence against infringement of copyright. We have the right to do this, and this is one way in which I think the BBC is infringing the law. I think the BBC is committing suicide by going down the DRM route, as has been said. Uh, if they go down the DRM route, then perhaps the licence fee will disappear, and then the BBC are just another commercial company, perhaps the BBC worldwide, you know. Thank you. Um, I think Felix is completely right that clearly it's in the spirit of the, of the, the good spirit of the BBC and its intentions that they should be uh, uh, fostering uh, plurality innovation uh, in hardware solutions throughout the media industry. There's a real opportunity uh, given the, 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 the quality of what the BBC does for it to, to do that and, uh, and, and to play globally. 
unfortunately, uh, the, its, its political position is actually hampering it from doing that. And I, I'm just going to share with you this, um, because it's behind a paywall, you might not otherwise buy it. There's a wonderful, um, there's a wonderful <coughs> interview in today's FT with uh, Mark Thompson. Um, and, I, and I do think that this is one of the ways in which one under, to, to understand the BBC, one has to understand this mindset. Um, he's being asked about faith and his own faith. He gives an extremely, uh, actually a rather confused answer about his Catholicism. Um, and then the interviewer asks, what about his personal faith in the BBC? And this is the quote. Not to be too theological about it, I suppose if you're talking about believing in it, that is the BBC, then there's the city of God and the city you've got. If you do my job, you're always looking at the heavenly city of the BBC as it could be, should be, and the whole time you're wrestling with the realities of big, noisy, complex, heterogeneous, creative organisation, and you're trying to move this particular city up the shining stairs to the city of God. This is, this is the man... <laughs> This is the man who's making the decisions, and this is his vision for his view, his vision of the mission of the organisation to uh, uh, m move this particular city up the shining stairs to the city of God. It seems to me, actually, that, it, that we've grown up, that it's time for us to be able to take control of this wonderful thing which a public broadcaster is, and to democratise and mutualise that process. Thank you. Mark? I've heard White City called lots of things, um, <laughs> but I can't say that's been among them. Um, I think the, the one question there actually came as the answer to the other, um, in that in stifling innovation, that's a direct consequence of the implementation and the mandating of, of DRM. Whether it's a legal mandate or, as in this case, it's, it's an effective mandate. Um, in commercial terms. Uh, ironically, um, I'm fairly sure the, the BBC has uh, promoting new technologies as one of its, uh, as part of its public purposes. Um, but that, as with so many of these things, is something that can be read in a number of ways. Um, I think the best way to bring about change <clears throat> is through the Charter. Um, I think it's worth engaging with the DCMS Select Committee and looking at ways in which if the BBC is going to ride very tightly performing a balancing act between what it's permitted to do and what it's prohibited from doing is to change the conditions under which it performs that balancing act. And if that can be achieved, then there's, it has no choice. If the Charter says, thou shalt not do this, then really it has no option but to not do that. So I want to close by, by telling an anecdote about the BBC and its role in innovation in British industry. Uh, years ago, in the, mid, in the early 2000s, I was on a uh, European Broadcasting Union DVB committee to add DRM to Europe's television. I, I was against it. That, that was my job. And uh, one day we had a meeting in Edinburgh, and all the engineers from all the companies across Europe who had come were all English, uh, mostly English, all British, uh, and um, uh, including the Microsoft engineer who then lived in Switzerland and was, was there representing Microsoft. Because it was nearly Christmas and because he was home in the UK, he nipped out during the lunch break and brought back a John Lewis electronics kit. And uh, all of the engineers started waxing rhapsodic about their first electronics kits and what it was like going down the shed with their granddad and building their first crystal set with cat's whiskers and how that turned them into engineers. And of course, not everyone who hears a broadcast makes a crystal set, but everyone who, makes, uh, who wants to become an engineer starts with something like this. And I said, gentlemen, you know that the reason we've gathered here is to ensure that it's illegal in Europe to build your own broadcast receiver, right? That's, that's what we're here for, right? You're here telling me that because the BBC had broadcasts that you could receive on your own home-built equipment, you became engineers. You became part of, in fact, a, uh, one of England's export commodities, which is smart broadcasting engineers. Uh, and, and now you are here to undo that good. 
surely this can't be part of what we think of as, as good for our own policy. When the BBC does it with our license fee, it seems like it's, it's not only bad policy in general, but specifically it undermines the BBC's own mission. You know, the company that gave us the, the, um, the BBC uh, uh, PC, it seems bizarre that, that they're now turning around and saying that tinkering with the product of our license fee should be something left to committees that negotiate with American companies to decide what we can and can't do and not to the average person. Thank you all.